Today we're going to take a look at my plugin bundle, all the plugins that I have installed on my work system and basically find out if I practice what I preach. So let's see if I'm snake oil or not and let's get started. All right, so I am running uh, two separated systems. I have a development uh, system and I have a uh, work system. Now these systems both run on the same Mac Mini. I've basically split up the SSD of the Mac Mini uh, and installed Mac OS two times. My development part is where I do my snake oil videos on and it's kind of clogged with plugins. The work partition, however, uh, I try to keep it as clean as possible and everything that is on this uh, system is what I use or have used in the past year and it could be really interesting also because I didn't check the list before I started to make this video so this could be a bit revealing uh, as well now let's get started with uh, looking at uh, what type of system that I'm using I'm running my full studio including the video editing part on a Mac Mini M1 2020 with 16 gigabytes of memory. I went for the 500 gigabyte version of the uh, Mac Mini and that is because I like to store my data on an external SSD. I'm using the Samsung T5 SSDs and it, it well, it works. I never have any problems with it. For video, it could lead to problems depending on your workflow, of course, uh, but for me, it works. Now, as you can see over here, I have it divided into two different partitions and that's my development and my, my work uh, partition. What you can also see over here, and I, I was expecting some comments from it, uh, is that I have a Scarlet attached to my system. Scarlet is just my easy to configure, easy to take with me uh, interface. Connected to the system as well as an ADI2 Pro, of course, the RME, and a Moto 8A uh, that provides the 64 in and outputs. Before I was running it over AVB, but AVB in combination with Moto, even though they have guided me through it, it still kind of sucks. And it's, this is the only way I can uh, have it working and it, it also keeps working. As the DAW, I'm using uh, Reaper, of course. Uh, Steely-eyed people would have also seen WaveLab over here. Uh, I'm not using WaveLab, but I am discovering WaveLab a little bit. Um, I want to see if WaveLab is actually a better solution for uh, mastering projects. But right now, apart from the fact that I don't have a lot of time, for me, WaveLab isn't yet. So uh, that will be probably in next year's uh, plugin video. Now let's make a channel and let's go to my plugin list. Now, if we look at VST3, uh, we already get a lot of Melda production uh, plugins. And quite honestly, I don't really use them, but I've installed the complete free bundle from Melda production. And uh, the cool thing is that sometimes when you're searching for something that you only need on, on one specific production, for instance, an auto panner or auto pitcher, or uh, let me see, I had a uh, tremolo, that kind of stuff. It's just great that that you have a Melda version installed because usually the Melda production uh, plugins are a bit more advanced than the other ones. But it's just for that rare occasion where you where you need something like that. But I think I use only three or four of these plugins once per year, something like that. The only one, and this is my my favorite Melda production uh, plugin, and this is one that I actually use on a more regular basis, is Freeform Face. And I know that I've been teasing a lot about like uh, there's one Melda production plugin. Well, this is it, the Freeform Face. And it's kind of a boring plugin, but it's also kind of a magic trick. Nah, it's not a magic trick. What this does is uh, you can adjust your face uh, based on the frequency. And this is kind of boring and so uh, yeah I mean where I use it for uh, usually is on, on bass drums uh, where the low end of the bass drum when I have multiple bass drum channels don't really line up and by using uh, uh, this like curves like these like maybe draw it in a different way you can get it to line up way better another reason for using it also on bass drums because you know these phase adjustments uh, are most effective on low frequencies. Uh, another way to use it is when I've processed something through an analog channel and then have to layer it with uh, something that is uh, digitally processed or not processed, maybe some, some parallel processing or whatever, then I can correct the, the phase correlation that an analog uh, EQ is giving uh, using this plugin. Um, using it just on one signal, you won't hear a lot of difference unless you go pretty far and like turn up the depth or whatever. But uh, basically uh, phase responses in, in this regard are really 
in comparison with another channel. So yeah, that, that's everything that I use from Melda Productions. Now, one that is almost slipping through the cracks is Melodyne from Salamoni. I use Melodyne on a regular basis to tune vocals, basically. Uh, I actually do this in the external editor. It just works better for me. I have it set in such a way that I can just right click and open in editor and then open in Melodyne. And uh, after tuning, I overwrite the original file. So when I switch back to Reaper, uh, it has my tuned file in there. And of course I save the Melodyne session in case I need to change something or whatever. I don't do all my Melodyne work myself. I actually work together with a very good vocalist. She's called Deborah Jade and she is doing the, the bigger uh, work when it comes to Melodyne. So if I need to Melodyne a whole album or like a lot of choirs or whatever, I'm not doing the Melodyne work. I'm, I, I just have Melodyne for the, for the small things. Another one in here is Micro from FabFilter. That, that is basically on my system because uh, FabFilter as well, you install it as the full bundle. I think you can select it in the installer, but uh, I, 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 I probably was too lazy for that. Then we've got the, the FabFilter bundle here. This is the, including this one, is basically the, the bundle that I'm using. Volcano, I, I don't really use, but Timeless I use, Saturn Pro, and the all the pro ones. Let me quickly open them and uh, talk a little bit about them. Pro C, I use it in uh, two styles. I use it in the clean style and I use it on the vocal style. And actually on my videos, I have a Pro C uh, on my microphone in a vocal setting. Of course it's got auto gain. Uh, I sometimes turn that off. Weirdly enough, uh, what I really like is uh, the fact that you can adjust the sidechain EQ both on the internal sidechain, so when it needs to trigger on its own signal, as well as on the external uh, signal. Sometimes you uh, just don't want it to trigger on lower frequencies or whatever, and you can just EQ it. Another thing that I use uh, regularly is the stereo link. There are a lot of times when I actually like to process stereo sources as dual monos, and that is to just you know, for instance, on, on backing vocals, we have one vocal on the left, one vocal on the right. Uh, you actually want them to be in the same level. So it's better to compress them as a dual mono than to compress them as a stereo uh, vocal. One thing to keep in mind is that if you click the sidechain window and close it again, it's, it goes back to its default setting. So these settings only work while this window is open. Very important uh, to know. Pro DS, uh, I actually use a DSer a lot and I don't know what it is lately. Of course, I've got very quick uh, monitors and a very quick, quick responding drivers in there, but it seems that a lot of recordings uh, suffer from um, too many S's, uh, too much uh, sibilance. And I've not been able to track down what this is. Maybe this is a microphone problem, maybe a preamp problem, maybe a converter problem. A converter problem could actually be, or, or maybe something else. We'll see if I know it, I'll of course uh, tell it to you all. Uh, but I need to do a lot of the uh, on uh, recordings. And the funny thing is, is that if I listen to other music on these speakers, I never have problems with the S's being too loud. And with like recordings that I'm using, like eight out of 10 just have too much sibilance in there. So. Something weird going on in, in yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't know what is going on. Uh, but anyway, I use the Pro DS. Uh, I drag the threshold all the way down. I search, of course, for the correct frequency and then adjust the range according to how much I want to, you know, cut out the, the S's in there. I usually just keep it on single vocal wide band and uh, I use the look ahead when possible. Uh, when it needs to feed into analog gear, I need to be aware of the fact that there could be some time delay and either turn off the look ahead or adjust for it later. The Pro G, uh, it's a gate. Uh, I sometimes use it on my videos when uh, there's more things going on, like when I've got my speakers uh, blasting or whatever. Uh, it's nice to have a gate on um, on my vocal as well. Uh, I sometimes use it on drums or on, on certain things. And what I really like, like the, the best feature of this gate and most other gates, by the way, is uh, the ratio and the range setting. Because when using it, sometimes you only need to cut out eight or nine dBs or sometimes even less, and it makes it sound more natural. If a gate all the way closes and all the way opens, for instance, if you're gating toms with some spill on it from the cymbals, cymbals are usually played together with the toms. So when you've got like the tom gate opens, you have some bleed from the cymbal and then the gate closes all the way. <laughs> Sounds really weird. And, and if you uh, uh, make the range a little bit lower, you are cutting out 
out enough bleed uh, while not getting that weird like opening closing sound. Of course, you can also do this with, with like a longer release time, but usually I just turn down the range. Basically what I do. Now, cool thing is that in the export mode, of course, you can uh, change where to trigger it. And this sometimes really helps if uh, you have a lot of false triggers in your gate. Uh, next one is the Pro L, uh, which is the limiter from FabFilter. It's basically you turn this thing up and everything gets louder. That's also what the L is for. The L stands for louder. I am using this most of the times on the modern setting. I use it with louder productions with a lot of oversampling. And sometimes I use two of them. So I have one on the modern setting uh, doing the big chunk and then uh, another one doing like one or two decibels on the aggressive setting or the, uh, what was it again? I think all round or punchy uh, setting. And this is for like those uh, productions that have to be uh, ridiculously loud. Uh, I'm not a fan of loud productions. Uh, I think it's it's most of the times not the best idea but uh, sometimes uh, you know I have to comply with my clients requirements and uh, in that case uh, yeah I use it another thing that I always adjust is the output level I basically never master to zero decibels it's always below it uh, and for streaming services it's actually uh, below minus one. What I like about the Pro L as well is that it has a built-in uh, loudness overview. Uh, it can quickly show me like uh, where I'm on average where I am. It's not it's not an absolute view. It can do integrated, but then you have to reset it and then play the whole track through it. Uh, but yeah. Next up is the Pro MB, which is a, a multiband uh, compressor. And I use this uh, actually almost always on my master bus. Sometimes I use it with five bands. Sometimes I use it with three bands. And what is cool about a multiband compressor is not necessarily uh, that you can individually compress uh, certain bands but that you can individually set attack and release times because quite honestly that is for me what multiband compression is about I can get quick uh, release on my uh, low frequencies and then have transients still push through uh, the higher frequencies uh, that kind of stuff I always use it in dynamic phase mode rarely use oversampling uh, this is basically this is basically how I set it basically yeah this is basically it one of the tricks that I sometimes do with the Pro MB is that I compress the low end on, for instance, a baseline with sidechain compression. Sidechain usually uh, has a big effect on the vibe of a production. And in some productions, like having full range sidechain can really be like that pushing effect. Uh, on other productions, you actually want to mask the fact that you're sidechaining a bit. In that case, I'm using the Pro MB on a low frequency band, feeding the kick in there with the sidechain and, you know, just only pushing the low frequencies. Now, of course, the Pro Q3, my most used plugin. It's basically my most used plugin. It's just super easy to use. It can do anything. It even has a dynamic bands, which are so easy to use that I use it more often than you might think. It's got an analyzer in the back, of course. I wanna play something back through here like this. It's got uh, very good filters, very steep filters as well. You can do mid-side on here. One thing that I want to warn you for is that the brick wall filter can ring a little bit. So I usually use the uh, 96 or 72 uh, decibel uh, setting when I want to cut uh, low frequency, sub low, uh, or even like sub sub low frequencies. So yeah, Pro Q3, a really cool one. Pro R, I do have enough reverbs in my studio. I have the round side machine. I recently bought a PCM60. I've got a Yamaha SPX90. And upstairs I have an EMT140 plate reverb. So, so when it comes to reverberation, I do have uh, enough resources. However, sometimes you need to create a very specialized reverb. And when it comes to reverb and creating reverbs, when you have in your head like, hey, it has to sound like this, you have to translate this to the settings. And if you look at like a lexicon and the settings that are in there, it's not really inspiring. And um, the way that the Pro R works with the decay rate EQ, uh, with the settings that you're getting over here and the uh, post EQ uh, stuff, uh, it's actually super easy to go from that idea in your head to a sound and tr translating it through this plugin. So that's why I like to use the Pro R then the Saturn 2. What I like about Saturn 2 is that you can split the bands. This is the only reason why I would use distortion uh, from the Saturn 2 because I have enough distortion uh, 
in my rack. I even have a tape machine. Usually I just use analog distortion because it's just, it's just better. But sometimes uh, I just need to use distortion on high or just on low frequencies. And uh, that is where a plugin like this shines. And this is really where digital plugin is way more powerful uh, than the analog gear. As far as I know, I, I don't actually know if there are like multiband distortion analog uh, units, but maybe there probably are, but I don't have them. So that's why I'm using the Saturn. Uh, and lastly, uh, the timeless uh, using analog delay. I actually have an analog delay and I'm very emotionally uh, connected to that one. So I'm never going to sell it or whatever, but uh, using it is, is well, really a lot of hassle. Uh, so I like to use a, a, the timeless three a digital one uh, it syncs to the session uh, it has a lot of uh, easy to use effects built in uh, it can basically do uh, everything that i need from a, a delay from from like basic clean delays to like complete weird delays uh, what is really cool about these effects also is that it's uh, it's really masking the delay a little bit so when you have a delay for instance on a vocal and the delay itself is very clean it's it's kind of difficult to really blend it in the production. You you actually want it to be a little bit uh, degraded. It's easier to, to blend in, is basically what I've noticed. So yeah, that's that's everything for FabFilter. Uh, let's move on with another one that was in here, the Split EQ, uh, which is from Eventide. And this is a pretty recent product, but I've decided to install it on my production system because it's just uh, very cool to use. And it's basically, as I'm saying, uh, there's a quote from me on the Eventide website. Who would have ever thought that that would happen? But the quote from me is that it gives us access to another audio engineering dimension. And, and I still think this is the case because it gives us access uh, to an EQ on both the transient and the tonal section of the music. And the way that it's doing this, uh, how the interface works, uh, is just really, really cool. I'll just link to the video about this uh, this plugin uh, over here. Probably have more videos about all the plugins that I'm talking about right now than I can put uh, information things in a video because I'm limited to three or something. Another one that's in here is Visual Mix Rack and I, I don't know why. Well, what I do know is that I think I know why. Virtual Mix Rack. Oh, could not be loaded. Oh, well, I'm not using it anymore. What I do know is that I installed the Virtual Mix Rack uh, when I still had my All Access Pals, which I purchased for my uh, tape shootout video. And I was looking uh, for um, some bus compression, saturation, summing kind of stuff uh, that could help me sum a production. I had some problems with, with uh, blending and uh, summing. Uh, a certain production. What I do remember is I didn't end up using the virtual mix rack. Uh, I actually ended up using the, uh, where is it? Uh, console 7 uh, from Air Windows. How this works is that you put the console 7 channel on all your uh, separated channels and then the console 7 bus on the uh, master bus. And it does something freaky with the uh, high frequencies. Uh, so that it's easier for your software to sum or something. Uh, I know that uh, Chris from Air Windows can explain this way better than I do. It's a very boring plugin uh, uh, from how it looks, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's basically Air Windows. Air Windows is one of those uh, plugin makers that you should really check out because the guy knows exactly what he is doing and just makes very great plugins. He just doesn't do any uh, user interfaces, like not no fancy user interfaces, just the basics. Cram RC, Cream RC is the remote control for my uh, Cream uh, compressor from Tegler. And I honestly never use it. And as you can see, it cannot even find its best friend or, uh, you know, better known, the, the crown because it's not connected. I decided not to connect it in my new uh, setup uh, because, uh, well, I basically had to run an extra cable and then I also had to connect a round side machine. Reason why I don't do it is because of a multiple of reasons. Uh, the first thing is is that I have more analog gear and I basically make pictures uh, about that. I would love to do a video about my like production side tools that I use in my studio. If you want to see that, uh, leave it in the comments down below. Uh, uh, that's a whole different story, but also very interesting. Uh, but I make pictures from all of my gear. I scra scrabble on there with, with like uh, the pencil, like what the settings are, whatever the important things, and then save that in my system. And while doing that, you know, I also take a picture from the uh, cream. So there's no need for that plugin. It's it's not really adding anything. Next up is the 
alpha compressor from uh, Illusia. And um, this is maybe the most snake oil plugin that I use on a regular basis because uh, look at it. It's not even screwed in. Uh, we've got the three dimensional knobs. We've got, uh, you know, everything, uh, but it does I, I won't say it sounds like a real alpha compressor because I know how the real alpha compressor sounds and, the, and that's also the reason why, why I basically just want to buy one uh, whenever I've got the financial uh, capability to do that. But this thing, basically, if you don't get too extreme on the settings, uh, will sound much like... Uh, the alpha compressor and one of the things that i really like from all illusia stuff uh, i've got the character from illusia over here uh, and that does the same thing is the mid side uh, processing that you can do um, it is um, if you don't know what you're doing you can really get your whole track out of balance but uh, it is a very handy tool to have also of course it does uh, parallel processing it, it, it's 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 a super versatile compressor and uh, it's basically, I've just got it installed basically just to prepare myself and to uh, learn the alpha compressor so that when I purchase it, I can just, you know, <laughs> use it and know how it works. <laughs> Let's see, because I think we're already pretty far through my bundle. I've got the loudness penalty installed. Uh, this gives us an overview of like how much your production is going to be uh, turned down by the different streaming services. Uh, I usually just use the website loudnesspenalty.com because that one uh, will take an integrated measurement. So it will measure the whole production, which is also how streaming services will measure it. Uh, this is basically just uh, great to get an indication uh, of your production. Let's see, we've walked through this, Melda production. Uh, of course, we've got all the Cocos plugins. Uh, the only one that I use is, is just the channel of polarity thing to swap a phase on the left or the right channel. And we've got RX-8, of course. Uh, RX-8 uh, is from Isotope. Uh, I actually always use it in the uh, audio editor mode. Uh, and it basically uh, is audio repair i use the denoiser i use the debreathing a lot i use the uh, deplosive declicking uh, all that kind of stuff sometimes i need to repair audio uh, from my clients and sometimes i well basically need to denoise my own audio most of all when it comes from the from the tape machine i mean there's not a lot of noise on a tape machine uh, on one channel but if you have noise from 24 channels all summing up together it is a lot. So that's when I need to use the um, the RX uh, bundle uh, and most of all the, the noise reduction. Another uh, plugin in here is the sample grabber, which is uh, the connection to my analyzer. Uh, I get a lot of questions about this and I'm constantly answering this. Uh, I am using the pure analyzer system from Flux. It's a really cool analyzer. It's, uh, it's showing me where my frequencies are in my left right spectrum, which is great for aligning uh, analog EQ and analog equipment. Uh, I've, I, I'm getting my spectrum, uh, phase, my measurements, my R128 and my uh, loudness history. It's a great thing. Uh, I actually don't use it with the sample grabber. Uh, I'm basically using a hardware uh, loop back. So um, everything that is my RME is sending out, my, my, my main converter is sending to my speakers, is also going back to my analyzer and I'm always seeing what I'm outputting. Uh, the last one in here is the uh, vocal synth. Uh, and I've used this on a production uh, where I needed to use it. Uh, I needed some um, some vocal synth weirdness. What you can do with this thing, it's from Isotope, is, um, is basically very easily uh, create uh, some warped, weird vocoder, CompuVox weird uh, voices. And uh, it's not really uh, what is included in my services, but sometimes uh, I just get a question from a client and then I'm like, okay, I'll do it. No problem at all. See if, if there are some things that I've missed. Nope. No, I think uh, yeah, this is all uh, JavaScript that comes with the uh, Reaper. Uh, I've got some uh, Ambisonic uh, plugins that I've experimented with. Um, basically, if I import my configuration file into Reaper, it automatically installs uh, these things again. So uh, I, I, I have to like clean up uh, this a little bit more. So yeah, that's that's basically it. That's all the plugins that I use. I like to keep my bundle uh, of plugins really small, and I'm actually. 
Kind of surprised at how big it uh, actually has become. Reason why I like a small plugin bundle is because it's very easy to reinstall uh, uh, when you reinstall your whole system. There's not a lot of headaches uh, with licenses and that kind of stuff. Another reason is uh, if you have a small bundle of plugins, you really dig into those plugins and really start to learn what they are all about. I actually think that giving yourself limitations um, makes you more creative. And uh, this comes from a guy that uh, you know has a lot of analog gear but you should think about analog gear as as parallel uh, chains when you have one uh, plugin you can put that on every channel that that single plugin but uh, when it comes to analog you can only use it on one channel at once and then you have to bounce it and then you can use the analog gear again so uh, that is why if you're going analog you need a lot of it uh, or that's basically basically my excuse for you know buying more um, <laughs> but every single piece of analog gear has its own limitations and that is also what creates some uh, creativity uh, for me so uh, so that is my basic advice like like don't go crazy on the plugins like just pick a few and well learn them so much that they become either your favorite one or that you hate them so much that you can uh, remove them uh, again in my day-to-day -day workflow, I use a lot more uh, apps and things. Uh, I actually have a Stream Deck over here with macros, which makes things a lot easier. But I also have a lot of productivity things. Uh, I'm using Notion and Missive and Dropbox, Numbers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, I actually have an assistant that uh, works for me and, and we have... Uh, a few uh, integrations so that working together uh, goes better, that kind of stuff. And this is actually necessary if you're professionally running a studio and have to handle a lot of different productions and a lot of different input from a lot of different clients at the same time. Uh, at this moment, I have around 40 different projects that I'm working on. So keeping track of all that is, is like a separated job actually. Uh, and if you wanna know how I'm doing that, uh, leave it in the comments down below and I might make another video uh, showing you all how, well basically how I'm running my business. So uh, uh, let me know that in the, in the comments section uh, down below. Now, full disclosure, uh, I'm not uh, connected or affiliated with any of these uh, companies that I've shown the products from. Um, they don't even know that I'm making this. This is basically <laughs> what I basically did is just booted up my system, uh, started the camera, uh, turned on the lights and, and that kind of stuff and just started uh, recording. Uh, I didn't even make a script or whatever. I, I'm actually kind of satisfied that, that, that there weren't any weird things that I had to uh, explain uh, to, <laughs> to you all in here. Yeah, maybe just a virtual mix rack, but... Uh, um, I think, I think I gave a good explanation for that. Now, if you like my independence and want to support it, that is possible by using the links down below. I've got merchandise. Uh, I'm actually wearing it again today, but it's it's still kind of cold uh, over here. So uh, I like to keep uh, myself zipped up. Also down below is my affiliate link. And the affiliate link is one of the most effective ways uh, to support uh, YC Studio. By clicking that link and then purchasing something in one of those shops, either Toman or Sweetwater, uh, you are helping the studio because a little bit of your purchase gets kicked back to me. So it's highly appreciated if you do whenever you need to make your next purchase. Now, a more extreme way to support me is by pledging a bit to my Patreon campaign, which I'm going to link over here. And on Patreon, you get early access to videos, answers to your questions, and uh, some other good stuff. It's all on Patreon. Check it out. It's over here. Last way to support me and the whole YouTube platform is by watching more videos. So I'll link one of my videos over here. But of course, YouTube will do its best to link uh, something else that is interesting for you around my video. Thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Keep pushing. And bye-bye.